Happy Wednesday, everyone. Pastor Matt here once again, diving into the book of Ephesians, looking at what it means to be praying with God's provision. We're going to be picking up our study in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. And tonight we are going to be looking at verses 14 through 15. Now, if you recall, last week we were looking and have been looking at what it means to be standing in God's provision standing in the armor that he has given us. Tonight, we are going to be looking at some very specific pieces of that equipment. So if you would, look with me at Ephesians 6, verses 14 through 15. We read there, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the plate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Stand. By now, I pray that we know that we are called to stand in the strength of God through the hope and security that comes from the full armor of God. This armor is for our protection. It is for our strength and encouragement. It is also for God's glory to make himself known to the nations. The command to stand is to demonstrate God's finished work on our behalf. After being told that we will withstand in the evil day, which we looked at last week, that's verse 13, we should now stand firm. That was the end of 13 there. Paul begins once again to stand therefore. Now as a summary, remember, whenever we see a therefore, What is it there for? Our summary is this. When we call to mind, we must call to mind all that Paul has just been saying. God is faithful. He has already provided. Evil may come, but it will not win. So stand firm and trust in God's provision. Tonight, we're going to look at three specific pieces of that equipment that Paul describes as part of the armor that we wear and the traits and the qualities that we demonstrate when we wear this heavenly provision. Now, here's the thing, too. I think that Paul's ordering of this armor and these, this, this various equipment is very specific. So, let's dive into this and let's look at how we are called to pray as we wear this armor. Immediately after being told to stand, we are called to tighten our belts. Now, listen, if I were to stand up today, I would not necessarily need to tighten our belt, my belt, because it doesn't really loose. But for our context, we must remember that one's belt was the source of their centeredness and certainty. Belts have come a long way. They used to loosen. But why do we need to tighten our belts as we stand? Because the belt would pull the tunic tighter. It would keep it out of the way and would also make certain that the weapon that was attached to that belt would not falter or fail. How terrible would it be as a soldier for your belt to be down around your knees and your sword lower than you could grab? Right? Such is the case if we don't tighten our belt. Imagine a track athlete in all of their speed and strength. Imagine if they tried to race in sagging pants or clothes that were falling down. If one hand was constantly needed to make sure things were not flailing everywhere, as they're trying to pull down pants that are falling, any soldier or athlete would be less effective in their speed and their service for whatever cause they had undertaken. Such is the case with our walk in the Lord. The belt of truth is a reminder that when we stand, we are to be ready for, to face whatever obstacles, trials, or uncertainties will come our way. The belt of truth is also emblematic in its meaning. When we stand, we are to stand upon the truth. Are we clear and confident in the finished work of Jesus on our behalf when we stand? If we are standing in God's provision, then we must trust his provision to its fullness. This means affirming and teaching that the Bible is the only source of absolute truth. Our society would like to dictate a personal and subjective truth. It's whatever I think that is the chief, that should be chief among us and deserves to be proclaimed. 
but we must not lose sight of the finished work of Jesus and God's provision. Such is the case when we pray. Because the Bible is the ultimate authority and source of truth. We must turn to God's word when we pray. Though we might be shaken at various times, we must trust that God is going to provide all that we need. If we are struggling with this and have doubts and uncertainties, then we need to read God's word, the very source of absolute truth. God does not contradict himself. His truth is eternal and God is faithful to provide. The psalmist writes, lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Psalm 25, 2. And again, send out your light and truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, to my God with exceeding joy. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Psalm 43, 3 through 4. When we pray, we must stand upon the truth, speak the truth of God's provision, and call to mind that the God we serve does not change even when our doubts and troubles arise. God is still good. So, tighten your belt and stand. After doing so, we are called to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Once we've readied ourselves, we put the armor on that is fashioned to protect us from lethal blows aimed to kill. For any soldier, guarding the vital spots in the chest is essential. That's been a transcendent truth for as long as people have been trying to kill each other. So, this is why we must put it on immediately after having made ourselves ready. Had we not fastened the belt of truth, however, the armor that we put on would be less effective. It would be less form-fitting, providing holes in different ways to pierce through. Instead, since we are clothed and prepared, having pulled in clothing and tightened it to us, our bre- our, the breastplate that we put on is going to be very form-fitting, providing a layer of protection that is not normally there. I imagine, too, that this armor, as it comes with God's strength, is heavy and thick. But to us, it's as light as a feather, much like that that secret mail that we talked about last week. In similar fashion, while normally we might feel the full blow of the attacks that target us, seeking to kill and send us asunder, we are still standing and holding fast because of God's strength at work in us. We bear Christ's yoke, which is easy and light, calling us to walk in his provision and relying upon his strength. When we stand, equipped with the belt of truth, wearing the the breastplate of righteousness, we must remember that we are standing in things that are not ours and have not been won by our own hands. We don't own them. We don't, we have not earned them. It is God that has given us these things. So when we think we can't do it, we must remember that it is the very righteousness of God that has been given to us to shield and protect us from the deadliest blows and attacks against us. Because it is from God, we can shout for joy like the psalmist that your righteousness is righteous forever. And your law is true. Psalm 119, 142. 142. The very righteousness that we stand in was described by Paul in Ephesians as a key part of our new self. Our new self that is created from Paul, created after the likeness of God and in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, 24. You see, We're not our own anymore. We are entirely new, fashioned after the very attributes of God that are not our own, but have been made ours to walk and serve the Lord in. The same is true of our armor. As we grow in the Lord, the armor becomes our own. 
We strive after truth and righteousness in all things because it is the Holy Spirit working in us to make us more like God. And because the Holy Spirit is of God and from God, we know and can be certain that it is working for his glory. As we close out our focus tonight, Paul has a little small note about the shoes that we wear, something that we might not often call to mind when we think of a soldier ready for war. Again, that is Paul's model, something, somebody that he very well could have been chained to. He's looking at this person and making observations. The Spirit is identifying them in him. Paul's small note about the shoes that we have received through the gospel of peace. Our vitals are protected, but we must guard our feet. Why? Much like walking on the hot ground or rocky terrain, our feet are vulnerable and a source of weakness if we aren't outfitted properly. Sure, calluses can form, but those are not a source of total protection. They will still cause weaknesses and moments of of, uh, just pain throughout the way. As we walk in God's provision, though, he is able to faithful to provide equipment for our weak feet. Recall that a few weeks ago, we talked about how the enemy will seek to trip us up, to force us to stumble and to cast us aside because of any flaw or any insufficiency we see in ourselves. Instead, we have shoes that give readiness that protect us and allow us not only to stand, but to serve in all ways the very thing that God has called us to do. Our prayers must be understood in a very similar way. That our prayer is serving us as we walk in the, in the equipment that God has provided us. This sense of readiness and peace. So, you know, consider with me for a moment that our normal and modern understanding of shoes and equipment is not like this. What do we have instead? We have shoes that are fit for every occasion. That's why our closets are full of them, right? Whatever certain situation pops up, is there snow? Okay, grab some boots. If it's hot and sweaty out, okay, grab some sandals. Others might say, though, that Crocs, are the shoe for all seasons. But would a croc do you well if you go hiking on steep terrain or uncertainty? Or would you want to run for any length of time in crocs? Do they give you that sense? In the same way, would you want to wear hiking boots while you're lounging on the beach or walking through sand? Or with running shoes, would you want to wear them while you're wading in water? Friends, we understand our shoes to be needing to meet the need of our circumstances. And so it is when we undertake um, different treks across the terrain as we look to explore God's creation. But listen, with the armor that comes from God, we have been given shoes And we are called to stand firm in them because they are all weather, all season, all circumstance equipment. We don't need to change these ones out. They provide readiness in all things because they're from the Lord. Now, the gospel of peace gives readiness and allows us to be fit for any trial or circumstance. This very gospel tells us that we are no longer at odds with God, but have been given a righteousness that is not our own, have been brought near when we were once far off, and have been made stewards of the truth, the love that we are, and love that we are heirs of God through Christ Jesus. We have been given the peace that we so desperately needed and could not provide for ourselves. As the psalmist writes, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This peace, this shalom, the Hebrew word for peace, 
is not simply an absence of violence or hostility. That's key because that's how we see peace. It's an end to a conflict. No, this peace is deeper than this. It is the wholeness that comes from knowing God and more importantly, being known by him. Psalm 37, 37 reminds us that there is a future for the man of peace. So it is with us. Paul's emphasis on peace should remind us that Jesus, as Paul wrote earlier, himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There is no, that's Ephesians 2, 14. There is no longer a separation between God and man. And even more so, there is no separation from God's chosen people and those outside of it. We have been given access through Christ. It is this very peace that unites us together as the very body of Christ. So this gospel of peace, when applied to our prayers, reminds us of the need to pray for unity, for love, for the peace um, for peace among our congregation and between churches. Because we need to be reminded that this peace that is through Christ is for all who are in Christ. It's not just for us at Hickory Grove. It's for those at the church down the road. And listen, we might not agree on everything theologically, but as long as our truth is, sa- is the same, we can stand upon that shared foundation. Yes, our methods may be different. They may be called to minister to something. We may be called to minister to something else. But we must see the peace that comes from God, that has been shown through our loving and merciful God to tear down the wall of hostility. That wall of hostility once separated the Gentiles From the very house of God, they were only allowed to a certain point. And if they passed that, they would be killed. Now listen, we don't live with that reality anymore. Christ has torn that down. The veil is gone. He has come to us. What a wonderful reminder of hope and salvation that we have. We must not seek strife or hostility. But we must hold fast to truth, be clothed in a righteousness that is not our own, and seek peace and wholeness that belongs to God. As we close tonight, I want us to specifically read and pray through an excerpt from Ephesians 3 that I believe helps summarize and capture all that we've learned about during our study tonight. Many commentators believe that having just written and started in the early part of Ephesians, having talked all about who God is and what he has done, that the excerpt that we read tonight is Paul's response in bursting out in song after having just written, especially of what God has done in Paul's own life, that he burst out in singing. In some ways, it's the transition from all that Paul has been has described God doing in the first three chapters to what and how we are called to live. And we're going to read this together. And afterwards, Pastor Eric will close us in a time of prayer. But I encourage you, read this with me. And read it in a spirit of prayer. Relying on the truth, the righteousness, and peace that have been graciously given to us from our Heavenly Father. So, let's read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Paul writes this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted in and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know 
the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Hey, good evening, Hickory Grove. Pastor Eric here, and thank you so much, Pastor Matt, uh, for your careful study of Ephesians 6, 14, and 15. And now it's time for us to go into our, our moment of prayer, but I just want to go back over uh, the te- read to you the text that Pastor Matt just read, just so that it's fresh in our minds. Paul writes, stand therefore with truth, like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. This reminds me of the letter that Paul wrote in uh, to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27. Paul writes, just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the gospel. Not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful for these words from Paul. We're grateful for Pastor Matt's careful study and teaching. And we're grateful that you give us truth, righteousness, and the gospel of peace. Father, in a time of turmoil and great tribulation that we have certainly found ourselves in now, and really it seems since the dawn of time, we know that your people are given this gift of peace, a peace of of knowing your son, a peace that comes by way of the gospel, a peace that sees man rescued, redeemed, and reconciled by the work of Christ. We're thankful for that peace that we have with you, the peace that we have with one another. And we ask, Father, for continued opportunities, not only for our hearts to be renewed by the gospel each and every single day, but to take the gospel into our community here in Johnston County and beyond, taking that gospel so that others can have the same kind of peace that we have with you, clothed, armored with truth and righteousness. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this Sunday.